Welcome to the Coming Clean Podcast with your host, Peter O. Hello and welcome to a new episode of Coming Clean Podcast. This is your host, Peter O. Estevez. Thank you for being here today. Before we get started, I want to remind you to please go on my website, comingcleanpodcast.com, and down and subscribe to be able to download the free episode of my up, upcoming book, From Lies to Riches. Just go to the website, subscribe, and soon we will keep you up notice and get you the first chapter. Download it for free as soon as it's available to you. However, today we are here to talk to an incredible human being, uh, Mark Randolph. Mark Randolph is a tech entrepreneur. He's an advisor. He's a speaker. He's an environmental advocate. And he's also the co-founder and former CEO of Netflix. Hello, Mark, and welcome to Come and Clean Podcast. How are you today? I'm well, thanks, Peter. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me on. Thank you for coming on. And, uh, you know, you have, you have a, an incredible book. And the thing that caught my attention about your book is the title. Because hmm. yeah, I, heard, I heard that many times. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I think, it's, I think it resonates with every single entrepreneur. In fact, it resonates with every single person who's ever had an idea, which is you get all excited and you run downstairs and tell your spouse or you go to the work and tell your coworkers or you're asking for money or you're telling your friend and they all say the same thing, which is, you know, that'll never work. And so <laughs> I figured that was the perfect title for a book about Netflix uh, because I can't tell you the number of times I heard that'll never work as I was going through that journey. You know, Mark, you have a very interesting story about how Netflix came about, but the one story that I completely related to, and it's also an incredible story, the way that you share ideas. Carpooling, tell us about that. Well, you know, Netflix certainly um, suffers from a bit of a mythology that, you know, somehow the idea sprung out of thin, thin air, fully formed in some, I guess, moment of anguish, I suppose, over a late fee on a movie. But, you know, the patrimony of every idea is really complicated. And so part of what I wanted to do in the book is explain that. But you're right. Uh, if there was a genesis, it probably took place during these carpooling sessions that uh, my friend um, and at the time boss, uh, Reed Hastings and I were doing back and forth from our home in Santa Cruz to our offices in Sunnyvale. And at the time, we had just agreed to sell uh, the company that we were both working for. Uh, and as a result, we were both going to be out of a job. Uh, and so I knew from that point, I was going to start another company. Uh, Reed, though, surprisingly, didn't want to start another company. He was going to change the world. He was going to become an educational philanthropist, which he's been successful at, by the way. But uh, he wanted to keep his hand in the startup games. The two of us decided we would do something together. He'd be the angel investor, and I would start it and run it. But we needed the idea, which of course is how this started. And the way we looked for ideas was simply banging them around in the car on the way to and from work. And we must have gone through hundreds of ideas. Like he'd pick me up and I'd be ready. And then boom, it would go the pitch. And I'll, I'll share one with you, which I think it was in the book, but it's a good one. I still think it's a good one, which was personalized shampoo. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. You cut, off, cut off a lock of your hair. You mail it to our team, uh, mail it into us, our team of ace hair scientists, whatever that was, would formulate the custom blend and you'd subscribe to it. And Reed didn't like that one. And so those other ones, another one was custom dog food, where we formulate the exact mix for your breed, your dog's age, his weight, the climate, activity, whatever. And he didn't like that either. Another one was a video rental by mail which I was really excited about because that was such a big category, but it didn't take much research to realize that was as stupid as the dog food and the shampoo because this was 1997. And so video back then came on those big VHS cassettes. I think you probably, the brick. Me, but you probably no, are the brick. To remember yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> the brick, it looked like a brick. <laughs> exactly right. And it weighed like a brick and yeah. uh, wasn't quite as, as durable as a brick. 
So for all those reasons, no go. And then um, the breakthrough, if there was a breakthrough, came when Reed heard about this technology called the DVD. And it was in test market in a handful of cities. And it was small and thin and light. And if we had just heard about the DVD uh, in and of itself, we would never have said, aha, DVD by mail. But what happened was it was that feeling that you probably get when you're cleaning the house and under the couch, you find a jigsaw puzzle piece. And you're going, what? Oh, that's the missing piece from that puzzle we were doing two or three months ago. And so it was that this little piece, the DVD, was the missing piece to the video rental by mail. But we go, okay, it only works if you can mail a DVD. And so rather than taking that on faith, we go, let's find out. And then mid-commute, I turned the car around, drove back to Santa Cruz, looked for a DVD to no avail because they weren't available. So we bought a used music CD and then went a few doors down and got a little pink gift envelope put the CD in the envelope and mailed it to Reed's house in Santa Cruz. Um, and it didn't take long. The next, very next morning when Reed picked me up, uh, he didn't even say anything, just held up the little envelope with the unbroken CD in it that had gotten to his house in less than 24 hours for the price of a stamp. And if there was an inciting moment, as they say in screenwriter speak, that was it. That's the moment we said, oh, this just might work. Wow. So that's where your famous quote now is, you look for ideas, you don't stumble upon them, comes from. Yeah, I, uh, I believe, I mean, you can stumble on them too, but the, the point is if you're waiting for the perfect idea to spring into your mind, like a eureka, uh, you'll be waiting a long, long, long time. You have to train yourself to look for them, you have to train yourself to recognize them when you see them. And you have to understand the fundamental thing about ideas is that they're all bad. There's no such thing as a good idea. The thing that seems so perfect, I promise you it's not. Uh, and if you keep it nice and warm and safe in your brain, yeah, of course it's gonna seem wonderful there, but that's not the real world. And as soon as you subject your idea to reality, when you collide it, as we say, with a customer, that's when you discover this is not a good idea. But that's where you learn, oh, there's something I didn't know. And there's your next idea. And it's a chain of events that if you're lucky and persistent, um, eventually, hopefully leads you to the one that finally works. You made it sound very easy, like everything fell into place. Uh, and Netflix has become a giant Bahama across the world. Uh, but there was stumbling blocks. You know, there was the day where the server crash uh, on the starting of the company. Tell us a little bit about that story. Well, <laughs> this is one of those, people go, oh my gosh, Netflix, it's so huge. You know, your own movies, and your own TV shows and all those things. But that, we started the company on April 14th, 1998. So 22 years ago, and it was wow. almost 10 years before we streamed our first movie. So this has taken a long time. And even getting to the point where we had a business model which made any sense uh, took us almost a year and a half. So almost from the, the get-go, there was problems. Yeah, and, and that's the nature of a startup is that Back then, it's not the same now, but it takes a long time between when you have the idea and when you can create the idea enough to try it. And in our case, it took us six months. You know, you could not then go up to the Amazon web services and get an instance of a web server and then use Shopify. And if you wanted payments, you could use Stripe. If you, any of those things, you had to write it all yourself. It took months. So we labored on this thing. And then uh, by April 14th of 1998, we go, we've done it. We've built a website, which works. We have a copy of every single DVD in existence where we've solved all the big problems. And <laughs> I remember on that, that was, was so exciting. And so it, we all were gathered in the office on that morning uh, in my conference room. And at one end of the room, we had a computer set up and we had rigged it up so a bell would ring anytime an order came in. 
And over at the other side of the room, we had a, a big table with a big bucket full of ice and champagne bottles and champagne glasses to toast our success and our launch. And then, of course, it was eight o'clock in the morning. You know, the CTO hits a few keys and we're live and we're all expectantly looking around. And of course, it doesn't take long. And then ding, ding, the first two orders and we cheer and we're opening the champagne and then mid pour it's ding, 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 three more orders. And we're clapping each other on the back that we're going to be so successful. And then it's quiet for a while, but we're so excited. We don't really notice. And then suddenly we're going, it's been a while since the bells rang and you know, this thing plugged in. And, and it, well, it turned out, as you mentioned, not 15 minutes in, we had crashed all of our servers. So my memories are not necessarily the toasting of champagne and hooray yeah. for us. Yeah. <laughs> I spent that day like pushing a shopping cart up and down the aisles of a, a Fry's Electronics. Uh, well, our CTO <laughs> was piling in all the parts we'd use to limp our servers along that long first day. And that was the moment where we collided with reality where the thought that we had solved all of our problems all of a sudden realized, wow, we're now in the real world. And the real reality was all those people who had told me that will never work, well, damn, if they were right. <laughs> <laughs> you have proved them right. Yeah, that's exactly right. <laughs> but, it, it, go ahead, Mark. But honestly, I don't give up easily. So that was just, that was the beginning of the, uh, of the struggle. We go, uh, uh, Netflix continues to grow. And then you have the David and Goliath battle, the meeting of David and Goliath with uh, Blockbusters, the infamous meeting. You guys are $50 million in the hole. They are a $50 billion company. You show up in shorts and a Hawaiian t-shirt <laughs> <laughs> on a private jet owned by Vanna White. Tell us that story. That's a fascinating story. Yeah, this was almost three years in, uh, two and a half years in. This is in the summer of 2000. And we had finally figured it out. So uh, it took us a year and a half of struggle, of trying everything we could think of to try and get rental by mail to work. And we finally had got it figured out. It was a subscription business, which I should have figured out earlier. But anyway, uh, and the, the thing about, not to get too geeky here, but the thing about subscription businesses is that you pay all the money to acquire the customer on day one. And then they pay it back in the terms of incremental profit month after month after month, supposedly. Uh, but it, there's a weird irony to that, which is that if you're hugely successful and customers come flooding in, all of a sudden that means cash is flying out the door. Sure. So there's this moment of real, on one hand going, oh my gosh, this is so exciting. We are crushing it. We are growing like crazy, but simultaneously watching your cash just evaporate as you pay for these free trials and this, the acquisition costs for all these customers. And to add insult to injury, uh, again, you may remember this is from the days of the VHS cassette. The summer of 2000 was the collapse or the popping of the dot-com bubble. And almost overnight, it went from any company with a .com, which could have raised money by just putting a sign up on their wall, and the trucks would back up the driveway and dump the cash out for you. All of a sudden, you know, they would put their hands like this and go speeding past. Yeah. So we were, we were screwed. We had huge expense, and ironically, we'd finally done it. So we did the thing that's natural at that point, which is we reached out to someone to save us. And the obvious savior was Blockbuster. And as you point out, they were, it, was a, it was a David and Goliath. I mean, we, I think that year we were gonna do $5 million in sales and they were gonna do $6 billion. And we had a couple of hundred employees and they had 60,000 employees. It was a total mismatch. And it took us months to get that meeting. And once we got the meeting, I thought we were done. This is so obviously a right, a great pairing. And we flew to Blockbuster and we, uh, we're on, as you said, we, you know, we figured if we're $50 million in the hole, what's chartering a private jet, just a, a rounding error. And flew to Dallas, went up and got ushered into this huge cavernous conference room. Um, and, in con and, and as you pointed out, we were, we were coming from a corporate retreat. So we were all 
in shorts and t-shirts and I was wearing flip-flops and in come the blockbuster folks and you know he had on John Antioco had on shoes which probably cost more than my car <laughs> and he sat, sat across the table and made the pitch that we would combine forces that they would run the stores we would run the online business we'd find the synergies between the two and it would be a perfect example of the, uh, the, the, the sum is greater than the parts, or however that expression goes. Um, and at first it was going great. You know, they were nodding attentively and asking good questions. But then the big question was, what should we pay for you? And we had rehearsed this on the plane. And Reed Hastings, who was there with me, leans in and says, $50 million? <laughs> Yeah, they they uh they didn't take too much to that number. They they to be honest, they kind of almost laughed at it. And and it was a, a really amazing moment because I thought that this was we had solved the problem that I've been struggling with for months. That this was going to be the the, the Deus ex machina, the hand from God that just plucks our our heroes out of danger miraculously. But now, not only were they not going to save us, they were going to compete with us. And so that plane ride back from Dallas was a very, very quiet, sobering ride where we realized that, you know, there was no end run. There was no secret way here. There was no magic that, as my, my dad used to say, you know, sometimes the only way out is through. And that if we were going to solve this problem, we were going to have to do it on our own. Your famous quote, gentlemen, there's one thing left to do. What was that quote? There was one thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I guess we did. I will say we did, did look at each other and go, okay, guys, now we're going to have to kick their ass. <laughs> and, you know, and, and listen, not to gloat about it, but we did. I mean, it took us 10 years, but eventually Blockbuster went into bankruptcy. And as of now, they have one store left. And, you know, it, it's sad in a way because there were 60,000 people who lost their jobs and I, you never want to take pride in something like that. But it's a lesson that says even the biggest, most seemingly invulnerable company has to be willing to adapt. You have to disrupt yourself. They have to be willing to make hard decisions that are different from what they're doing now if they're going to survive. And a lot of companies don't have that ability or that courage and Blockbuster, unfortunately, was not able to do it. Um, and they fell to the company who was nimbler and willing to reinvent itself time and time again to stay current. Absolutely. Now, what is the lesson that we can take from this for the young entrepreneur? You know, today, everybody's an entrepreneur. All you have to do is put it in your tag, uh, on your Instagram account, on your Facebook account, on your Twitter account, and everybody's an entrepreneur. And, and, and there's, there's, I, I love, I, I have done quite a bit of research on you and I, I love a lot of the quotes that you use all the time because they resonate with what's going on in life. But one of them that you said, everyone tells you to follow your dream, but nobody tells you how. <laughs> yeah, very true. Okay. Uh, so, so, so what is that lesson for the young entrepreneur, the entrepreneur today that wants to start a business? What would you tell them? So far and away, and I do, I speak to countless entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs want to be entrepreneurs. And the single biggest barrier to people actually doing it, actually following their dreams is they don't start. Uh, and, and that sounds so trite, but it's such a common problem. And we all fall prey to that, is that we all have these preconditions of what we think is necessary to start. I mean, I heard, and I've heard them all, you know, I need, I need to raise money. I need to finish school. Oh, I can't quit my job. Uh, oh, I need a higher degree. Oh, I need a coat. And that's such BS. Um, those are all, pardon me, those are like excuses that we are all scared to take that idea that's in our head. And of course, it's safe and warm there, as I said before. But the only way to start to find out if it's a good idea is to put it out there. And so the skill these days is not how good is your idea. I quite frankly don't care what your idea is. Your skill is how quickly and easily and cheaply can I test my idea? How can I take that idea and get it out in the world immediately without having to raise money, without having to learn to code, without having to find employees, without having to quit my job? Um, 
That's the skill. And that's what allows you to start. Because when you say, when you removed all those restrictions, anybody can do this. You don't need to be in Silicon Valley. You don't need some kind of special degree. You don't even need to be particularly smart. You just need to try something. Yeah, and, and I, also, I, I also believe that the idea is not to get married to your idea, but to look for other ideas that come as, you know, you, you wanted to do something with the VHS and you ended up doing it with the DVD. So you just needed a small twitch. Yeah. And, and, and once you did that, you were able to uh, create the business that you, uh, in fact, a bigger vision, a, a bigger vision of what you had originally thought about. Uh, go ahead. No, no, I was just going to expand on that, but you're doing, you're doing great. Go <laughs> no, 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 please, please, please. Oh, no, I was going to say, you use the words, you know, it's falling, people fall in love with their ideas. And it's such a dangerous thing. Again, because you're, I, I, whatever, you can tell me your idea right now, not you. But, okay, good. Well, that's wrong. I can tell it's wrong. It's flawed. And because I, you, they're all flawed. That's why you've got to start. And the more you fall in love with that idea, the more you keep trying to find some way to make your idea work, the more you're wasting time. So the trick is you don't fall in love with the idea. You fall in love with the problem because the problem never goes away. And the problem withstands uh, almost limitless research you can always learn more about, well, exactly who has this problem? When do they have this problem? What is difficult about this? What is challenge? What are they gonna face in the future? And the more you understand about the problem, the more you can keep firing ideas at it, like they're coming out of a machine gun, until you find one that all of a sudden ends up, boy, this is, I'm beating this analogy to death, but it's like the magic bullet that actually does, uh, Solve, solve some fundamental truth, some problem they're having. And when you see that happening, I swear it is like magic. All of a sudden people go, oh my gosh, that makes my life easier. That makes it so much expensive, so much faster. And then, then you hit this thing, you hit product market fit and boom, all of a sudden you cannot hang on. Things are accelerating so quickly. But it has to start by starting. It has to start by not falling in love with that first idea, but recognizing it's just the first stepping stone on the path. You also share an idea where I, the, the idea that I call the beer test. The, a, 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 the beer, beer test? Yes, a, a, and it was a, a group of buddies drinking beer and at two or three o'clock in the morning, they were trying to figure out how to deliver beer. You remember that, that, that story? Oh. Oh, from my story, you mean? Yes, yeah. your story. Your story. Yeah, okay, that was good. Yeah, uh, that is a great. Uh, I was going to use a di slightly different story. That's a perfectly good one to kind of illustrate what I meant by how testing your idea quickly, cheaply, and easily. I mean, sh should I kind of regale you with that? I, 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 absolutely, please, <laughs> please. Okay. So this is a young entrepreneur that I worked with quite a few years ago, and you know he was probably in his late twenties. Uh, and one night found himself uh, in a situation that many young 20 somethings find themselves in. He's at a party on a weekend late at night and they ran out of beer. And of course began arguing about whose turn it was to go out in the rain and find an open liquor store and buy beer. And he, him being an entrepreneur said, aha, there's a problem. Again, looking for problems. Uh, and then boom, it, the idea came. Why can't there be I have a cell phone. It knows where I am. The cell phone knows my taste in beer. It has my credit card stored. It knows all the open liquor stores and who delivers. I'll press a button and boom, the beer gets delivered. Okay, good idea, maybe. But you got to figure out, you got to collide it with reality. And back in the day, back in 1998, you would have had to build a website, you would have had to try do a long process. And he didn't want to do any of that. He did not want to raise money. He did not want to code anything. He didn't want to find a technical co-founder because he began to break the problem apart and say, am I curious whether my phone knows where I am? No, of course not. That's obvious. Am I curious about whether people will trust me to store their credit card? No. Am I curious about whether I can do a database of open liquor stores? Again, no. Those are all known issues. His question was a more fundamental one, which is, does anyone care? And then if they do care, what size orders will they be? When will the orders come in? How, what's the average order size? Is it a repeat business? 
And then being clever, he figured out a way to test that idea without actually doing any of the things that would hold back most wannabe entrepreneurs. And his solution was so simple and so elegant. He just printed up some business cards that simply said, need beer, call me, and his phone number. And he'd stand outside apartment buildings on Friday and Saturday nights, and anyone who came in the door looked over the appropriate demographic, he'd hand them the card and say, hey, if you need beer, call me. And he'd go back and wait, and the phone would ring, and he'd take the order, and he'd get in his bicycle and go to the liquor store and buy the beer, and then go up, put on a Viking costume, don't ask, <laughs> go up in the elevator and deliver the beer. And it was a terrible idea because the orders were small. They all occurred at two o'clock in the morning. People were always drunk. There was no repeat business. But he found that out with nothing more than a business card. And sure, a $30 investment at the most. Exactly. And his time. Mm -hmm. But uh, he also found something else out. By colliding the idea with reality, he realized it was a bad idea, but he began learning about the problem. And someone said to him, hey, you know, I, this is kind of interesting. I'm the office manager and we have these parties two or three days a week and I'm always carrying cart cases of soda and beer up six flights of stairs to our office. Maybe you deliver to our office. And he did that for a few months and that failed. And then someone said, this is great. I wonder if you could maybe bring some things by my house later. And it turns out that the home delivery, stocking people's refrigerator while they were at work, was the magic. But he found out all those things with a business card. Now, was it repeatable? No. Was it scalable? No. But it allowed him to capture the key information about whether his idea was actually a good one so that when it came time to hire people, to raise money, he didn't have to wave his arms and go, imagine if you will. He was able to say things like, I've been doing this for three months and I know the average order size. I know the customer acquisition cost. I know the repeat. I know the churn. And that was a very, very compelling message to get people to join him in his journey as well as have people fund him. And that's the key. How quickly, how cheaply, how easily you can test your idea. At what moment does somebody surrender that idea? At what moment do you decide, oh, you know, give up? I heard it, give up? <laughs> Oh, almost instantly. Uh, it, but again, I'm keying off the idea. If you try an idea and it doesn't work, no matter how sure you were that it was a great idea, oh, tough, on to the next one. So you give up on the idea instantly. The harder question, the one that I will admit I'm struggling to give people advice on all the time is when do you stop trying to solve a problem? And most people only saw, stopped trying when they're forced to, when they run out of time, when they run out of money, occasionally when they run out of ideas, or occasionally when they learn so much about the problem, they start to realize how hard this problem is to solve, that it's actually beyond the capabilities. But I almost never see that happen. What usually happens is people begin working down the path and then something external um, knocks them off the rails. It's usually not, I give up. You said something in, um, in one, of your, one of your talks and you talked about, you can give up everything, but don't give up optimism. <laughs> yeah, well, that's what it takes. You know, it's that you have to always believe that the thing you're trying is gonna work and not just pay lip service to it. You have to fundamentally in your heart believe you're gonna solve this problem. It's a very odd balance of things you have to go, oh, this is going to work and believe it. And then as soon as it doesn't, you have to accept the reality that the, the marketplace has voted and they voted against you. And you've got to go, oh, darn. And you get knocked down and then you have to get up again and try it again. But, you know, when everyone does tell you that'll never work, well, the real reality is that most of the time they are going to be right. But the other reality is not always that if you are persistent enough, if you keep on trying, that it is possible to solve even the hardest problems. Um, and again, you know, I'm no smarter than most people. I don't work harder than most people. I'm not, maybe I'm luckier than most people, but I, I'm not fundamentally different from anyone out there that anybody can, can do this. 
it just requires that belief that there is a path through this and I'm going to find it. Who has been your biggest naysayer? Who has been that person by your side that has said, no, Mark, I already told you it's not going to work. Who has been that person in your life? God, I don't know. I, don't, I, I mean, that's kind of funny you say that. I, could no, I can't really even think of someone. Oh, mostly because, and this is going to sound stupid. It's not, I'm not drawn to people who are cynical and negative. So I, I, I'm not one of those people who goes, I like having this person around because they're always telling me I'm wrong. I, I, I love having people who will argue with me. And, uh-huh. But that's not a naysayer. That's someone who believes in something very fervently, and, but just happens to be something different than I believe in. I love that. You know, Reed Hastings and I had this incredibly wonderful and productive relationship where we were completely honest with each other about what we thought about each other's ideas. But what that allowed us to do was argue like cats and dogs sometimes, but it was never personal. It was always about, wait, what does the data show? What would a customer like? What is the market for this? What do we think is the right approach? And it was actually incredibly helpful to have someone who disagreed with me a lot because as soon as one of us convinced the other, all of it, we both would go, oh, that's it. And instantly forget who may have been the person arguing for and against because it was self-evidently the right thing to do. That, and it did, I love and it, Yeah, and it didn't matter because you could, you, you met, you came to a meeting of the minds. You agreed to what you were, you, you came to solve the problem. It's very true. And that's, that's a culture you can build, not just with one person. You can build it with a lot of people. I mean, there is, the thing is, good ideas are not the province of someone who is this more senior in an organization. The great idea that transforms the business could come from anybody. And you have to have this culture which respects that, that anyone's idea is almost equivalent to anybody else's because they're all potentially bad ideas. And we're going to let the market decide which is the right idea. So if anything, you argue about, not which idea should we try, but how are we going to know whether this idea actually worked or not? You argue about how you're going to measure it. You argue about what do we want to see that would tell us that was the right approach. And then you build this culture where everyone can be honest and transparent and argue and take positions. And then when you've made a decision, the ego is gone and you fall in right behind that idea as being the self-evidently right thing to try. And Netflix was... uh one of the early starters of building a culture, going out and hiring the best talent available, providing incredible incentives and incredible packages. In fact, uh, there was a point where they would actually pay you to, uh, uh, to quit if you weren't happy with the company. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And how did that program get started? Sure, but first, I want you to forget everything you just heard two seconds ago. Not about great packages. It's not about great incentives. It has nothing to do with that. It is not about nap pods and fireman poles and Olympic swimming pools. That's all ridiculous. There's a fundamental truth about what it takes to attract and retain amazing people from Netflix's perspective, which is that people want to be treated like adults. And that is an incredibly powerful motivational force for someone wanting to work in a place and they want to be surrounded with great talent. Um, And that's easy to say those two things and very hard. And I must say that that culture is not unique to Netflix. In fact, it's a very similar culture at almost every early stage company, meaning a company that has a dozen people, because when you're that size, when you're very small, you've handpicked everybody. You, every single person is usually grossly overqualified for their position. And the most important thing is you have way more to do than you have people and resources to do them. And so there just is no time whatsoever for managerial command and control. I mean, all you can do is say, okay, Peter, listen, I need, I need you to make sure this happens. And in two weeks, we're going to meet on that mountain about three miles from here. You see it? Yeah. I'll see you there. And that's it. That's the last I'm going to talk to you, Peter, for the next two weeks. And you're going to begin to have this incredible journey of your own where you're bumping into problems and you're solving them and you're scratching and you're bleeding. And But two weeks from now, I know you. You are so competent and responsible 
that you're going to show up on top of the mountain on time with everything we needed done, done. And that happens all the time in an early stage startup. There's this tremendous freedom to solve the problems the way you see fit to solve them, but paired with this incredible responsibility to all the rest of us to get your piece of it done. Okay, all well and good. 12 people, piece of cake. The problem comes is you get a bit bigger. And now all of a sudden, George or Mary shows up on the mountain and she doesn't have um, everything with her. Or she, let's say she's a little bit late. And uh, you go, ooh, that's not good. All right, from now on, we, I want to know in advance this is going to happen. So everybody, can you all start giving me status reports every two days? So I get an early, and everyone goes, oh, status reports. And then someone else shows up, and they're on time, and it's all done, but they spent a lot more money than you expected. And you go, oh. All right, from now on, I want everyone to pre-approve their expenses over $100. And everyone goes, oh. And what you've really done now is you've said, I need to defend myself against people who have bad judgment. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to treat all of you like children to make sure that the two people who really are children I've uh, protected us from. Netflix does it differently. It says, we're not going to have any guardrails whatsoever. We're not going to protect ourselves. We're, all, we're not going to tolerate people with bad judgment, which is, again, easy to say, hard to do. We're going to build a culture for people who have, can be given that responsibility. In exchange, they'll be given complete freedom to do their job. I mean, so people wonder, see, you got me started on culture. You know, Peter, you probably do know what the Netflix uh, expense policy is. Please elaborate. There isn't one. Okay. Do you know about the Netflix vacation policy? There isn't one. Uh, there are no policies at Netflix. Ser seriously. There's one. It's called use your best judgment. And if someone doesn't display good judgment, you find out pretty quickly. And then to your earlier point, Peter, they shouldn't be there. And they're given a good, very, very generous severance. And we say, thank you. You're a great person. You're just not right for this environment. But we often say we're not a family, we're not a family. We're more like a sports team where the manager's job is to make sure the best players are in each position because their job is to win. But more importantly, if you have a star shortstop, the thing that motivates, pardon me, I'm using US baseball analogies, but uh, I don't know about your, how international the audience is here. But if you have a star player, the responsibility to them is not how much you pay them. They want to win. So your responsibility is to make sure the other players on the team are equally good. And that's a huge responsibility. That when you say, oh, this person's not so good, but he's a good person. So let's keep him around. People don't go, oh, Mark is so nice. They go, oh. they go, there's two things potentially wrong with Mark. Either he's stupid and doesn't notice this person is not performing or he's weak and doesn't want to do anything about it. And that's not, that's not how managerial responsibility is. Your job is two things, put the right people in the right positions, give them the information they need to make good decisions, and then get out of the way. So don't build, don't build a business or a startup around a family unit, <laughs> build it as a team, and, 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 and let each person take responsibility for their position and what they're responsible for. Yeah, I'll give you a quick example if we have quick time for please, this. Please, please, please. It it's like people think, oh, this freedom and responsibility is only for the senior vice presidents and things like that. It's not. It's every position. You know, uh, one, if one hiring for the, and it, the receptionist, the, the, the man or woman who sits at the front desk, too many companies goes, okay, your job is be here from eight to five. You get one hour for lunch. You always have to do this, do this, do this, and the long list of what you should do and don't do. At Netflix, we would say, even for that position, your job is to put the best face on the company. You're the first thing they're gonna see people coming in. Take that as your responsibility, period. And that you person has to- them. Exactly, that person has to mm -hmm. make a judgment about what hour should I be here? If that person needs to go and take a doctor's appointment, you don't go to your boss and say, can I go to the doctor? 
of course you can go to the doctor, but it doesn't mean you can't be responsible for the company putting their best face forward. So find someone to cover for you. Don't ask me, can I eat at my desk? Form the judgment. Is that putting the best face forward for the company to be eating at your desk? And decide. So th th this can work every place. And it's amazing. Once you've empowered people at every level to make decisions for themselves to have a real responsibility at every level that is what attracts and retains the very very best people because incredible. who wouldn't love a job like that absolutely incredible mark where are you today netflix is my sixth startup and so i had been doing it for a long time and of course i had many many more ideas for companies but i decided i was done starting companies but you can't uh, walk away. I mean, I think like an entrepreneur, I can't. So the way that I get my fix now, I call it my, my methadone treatment, my withdrawal symptom modifier, is to, I mentor other early stage companies. I have a handful of uh, entrepreneurs that I work with, and I do my best to help coach them into how to be ideally the best entrepreneurs they can be. And not superficially, it's not an advisor. I need to spend enough time to know them, to know their co-founders, to know their team, to know their competition, to know their product, to know the market, because it's not an altruistic thing. I need something from this relationship. I need that feeling of being able to sit at the table with the really smart people and solve these really interesting, complicated puzzles. And by embedding myself in a company like that, I get that. I get to be part of a startup. I get that challenge and that excitement, but I get to then go home at five o'clock, whereas right. they have to stay up all night uh, making this stuff happen. So, you know, that's, that's a big piece of it. But the other thing, quite frankly, the reason I decided to want to start my own company is that I have a lot of other passions in my life. I'm, I'm the person who, when they find something interesting, I like to go deep. And I wanted to make room to pursue those things. And then the third, third pillar is, you know, I have a family. I'm married, I've been married to the same woman for a long time. I have three kids. Um, I wanted to make sure I had more time to have live that part of my life. So what, I've been, what is Mark doing after Netflix? Mark is perfecting balance. Mark's trying to say, how do you put these pieces together in a way that really completes um, a life? And that's now my new target. Mark, what is the biggest challenge in your mentoring that you find with entrepreneurs? What is the, where, where are we conflicted the most? What is the biggest challenge an entrepreneur has as, it's, as you? It's almost, it's almost, without exception, interpersonal issues. And I didn't expect that. I expected that people would be struggling with what's our go-to-market strategy or is our technology stack right or how do we raise enough money? And of course, I'd say you spend probably half your time on those issues, but the single biggest chunk of time is uh, interpersonal. Either I don't understand my co-founder. He uh, usually it's a business person saying this about a technical side person. He wanders in at 11. He is there until two in the morning. It, I don't get it. And it's working out a very, very complicated relationship between two people who are each critical of the success of the company and have to learn how to work together closely and respect each other's style of working and have it be much more objectives and results-based. But it's also, entrepreneurs struggle with the exact same things that I struggled with, which is, you know, I vowed when I started um, uh, being an entrepreneur that I did not want to be one of those guys on my sixth company, but also on my sixth life. And that's also something people struggle with is how do I maintain balance? How do I keep a relationship alive? How do I have my children grow up with me knowing who they are and having them ideally know who I am? Um, and those things are a challenge for everybody, especially once the business takes off and it becomes a very, very demanding mistress. So how do we find that balance? Well, you have to, you have to decide what's the most important thing to you. Um, and you know, for me, there was always three big things in my life. And certainly the business is a critical piece of that. I take that very seriously. It, it, it's, I'm driven to solve these problems. 
But as I said, I, I love my family. And, and, and with all sincerity, I love spending time with them. And the third thing is I do a lot of things that make me whole as a person, which is now I'm a big outdoorsman. I do a lot of climbing. I do a mountain biking, kayaking, you know, backcountry skiing. And you can't squeeze in a three-day mountaineering expedition in the gap between your 10 o'clock call and your 11 o'clock call. Right. You've got to carve out big chunks of time to make these things happen. So there's a lot of time prioritization. And there's a, no, now this is going to get a little abstract, so bear with me. But, well, I, uh, yeah, okay, I'll tell you the quick one. So I, I worked in, in Europe for a, um, a long, about a, quite a while, and I worked out of a headquarters in Paris, but I would have meetings one day in Germany, the next day in Italy, the next day in UK. And so I spent a ton of time on airplanes. And I learned during that time in Europe to never run for an airplane. And the reason is that of the hundred times you run for an airplane, the amount of times that you're going to make it when you wouldn't have made it walking is once that almost all the times you run like crazy and you get there, the doors are already shut, the plane's gone. Or more usually you run like crazy and you get to your seat and you sit there perspiring in your coat for 20 minutes before they take off. It turns out that all that hustle almost never makes a difference. And the same Wasted thing- Wasted energy. Exactly. Wasted energy. <laughs> so if people think I have to be at my desk all the time. I have to solve every problem. I have to resolve every conflict. I have to answer every email, return every call. And that's not true. Most of the time, it is not going to make the difference between success or failure. What makes the difference is though two or three key important things that you have to get right. You can do that if you're smart about it in half the time. So you have to then carve out these other blocks. You have to say, I mean, I, I talk about in the book how every Tuesday, rain or shine, without exception, I left the office at 5 p.m. to go on a date night with my wife. And in a startup, that's not easy. You know, there's a crisis, but my motto was we're going to solve it by five. And if someone goes, Mark, I have to talk to you. Well, we're going to talk on the way to the car. And amazingly, all those conflicts, they stop happening after five o'clock. People realize you're serious. You're not going to take a meeting or a call at seven. And even better, since culture is what you do, not what you say, people began believing me when I said it's important for us all to have some balance in our lives. And they began taking date nights and taking time off to do their things. It, it's a, it only happens if you think want to squeeze time in with your family and your friends and squeeze time in to go out and go for a run, you're never gonna do either of those things. You have to say they're important to me, I'm gonna make time and I'm gonna defend that time against the other demands in my life. Absolutely, and you know what's interesting, uh, Mark, is that you've been practicing this mindfulness that is a new wave in today's uh, world. You know, we talked about the five things that everybody does every morning. You know, we talked about all these tools or, or the five hacks that every successful entrepreneur has. And the reality is living a normal, balanced life and prior prioritize what's important to you. It's funny, it's true. It's like dietary advice. Yes. Oh, this, this is the no salt diet, and this is the only <laughs> foods beginning with L diet. And but you know, it all comes back to eat a balanced diet. Right? Yeah, absolutely. You know, exercise. Everything, everything in moderation. Everything in moderation. Oh. Mark, tell us a little bit about your book. Tell us go a little bit more detail about your book. You know, I thought people said people always would say, Are you gonna write a book? And I would go, No, why would I want to write a book? And in fact, you know, that that will never work. Um, wasn't written until 16 years after I left Netflix. And there was kind of two reasons why I decided I wanted to write the book. I mean, the obvious one, I guess, was I wanted to tell people that untold story of Netflix, that it was not a company which sprang forth in this sudden vision. It was not a company which instantly sprung into this worldwide enterprise with offices and you know, all these incredible shows and movies that we struggled for a long time, that we had an office with dirty green carpet and we brought beach chairs in because we couldn't afford furniture. I wanted them to see that there was a long struggle. 
And it's a great story, I think. It's funny, it's challenging, it's sad at times. But I wanted to see the real story. But the bigger reason is that I learned something really interesting. And you mentioned earlier my comment that, you know, everyone says, follow your dreams. You know, that's the commencement advice that every single commencement speaker gives. But no one ever explains how. There is no follow your dreams 101. And I realized after I began working with so many startups, I realized that all these tips and tricks and secrets that I'd learned in 40 years as an entrepreneur were the exact same tips and tricks and secrets that you could use to take any idea and make it real. It does not need to be a tech startup. You could say, I'd love to live in Idaho for a year. Well, where do you start? How do you make that dream a reality? And it's the same for anything, a nonprofit, a club you want to start, somewhere you want to live, something you want to do. And it's a process and it can be learned. And I didn't want to make it a preachy book by saying, it's, it's not a you book. You should do this. You should do that. You should do that. It's a me book. It's, I explain, here's how I use these things and here's how they worked. And um, you'll infer how to use those exact same things to make some things come true in anyone's life. I want to close with three questions. And the first one would be the current state of affairs of our country and the world for that matter. And what would be the advice for that struggling entrepreneur that um, cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel? You know, uh, there's many struggling companies, as you well know, uh, you know, and, and, and we're beginning to see primarily in the service industry, you know, two major hotels announced their closings, uh, one in Los Angeles and the other one in New York. And there are iconic properties that have been around for, for many, many years. So where do you see the future of the country? And what would be the advice to the entrepreneurs? Yeah, it's really, it's really tragic um, seeing how much disruption COVID-19 certainly has inflicted upon our, our lives, both personally, obviously, people losing friends and family members, but also on our economy and on our jobs and our way of doing things. Uh, but worse, in my opinion, is the opacity of it all. Is you, it's so hard now to see what's going to happen. I mean, e some companies, of course, are hurt in a very negative way, you know, service industry, restaurants, hotels, airlines, but a lot of industries are helped immeasurably. You know, yes. E-commerce uh, booming, certainly streaming booming, but all of them are faced with the exact same challenge is, what's it gonna look like a year from now? Is it gonna recover? Is it gonna be the same? If you're booming, do you go, it's gonna go back to where it was or is it gonna stay there? That is the challenge, is not seeing what the future brings. And that's where the lessons from being a startup can help us all, which is that what startups are taught to do, what they've uh, uh, evolved to do, is to feel their way through things. For a startup, everything is opaque. You have no idea how you're going to solve this problem. You have no idea what the future is going to bring for you. You learn to try things rapidly. You learn to quickly adapt to what you, what you find. And what's happening now is every company, large and small, every industry, both in the U.S. and abroad, is now having to do that. So the quicker we all can learn to think like startups, I think that's probably the best and maybe the only way that we can all learn how to deal with what the future is going to bring us. And now let's talk about the sensitive issue at hand, which has been which has plagued our country, and it seemed to be parallel with, with coronavirus, and that is Black Lives Matter. How do we heal and how do we move forward? And what do we do as, as, as public figures, as people in the forefront? Uh, uh, how, do, how do we help? How do we engage? And how do we change the course of history? As, I mean, the frank answer is I don't know. One of the things, certainly, you know, I'm 62 years old. I have been seeping in bias um, my whole life. And I, it, it would be naive of me to think that I haven't absorbed it in ways I still don't understand. And so my certainly personal journey is just to, re is to accept the fact that I have biases I'm unaware of and struggle each day to say, I'm going to do better today than I did yesterday and do better tomorrow than I did today. And I think if all of us could learn to do that, I think that would be a helpful step. Um, 
The other thing, if I can have any opinion, is just reinforcing the value that diversity brings to everything in our lives. And I am not just referring to diversity based on skin color or diversity based on background or origin or religion or gender. It's really diversity of opinion. It's diversity of thought process. It's diversity of what you've experienced. And time and time again, I've found that the more diverse a group of people that I can surround myself with, the better experience it's going to be in terms of the quality of our outcomes, the vibrancy of our decision making, the personal experience and growth we all exhibit from being exposed to people of different um, ways of thinking. Uh, and the, the more further we move away from that, I think the more damaging um, everything becomes and the closer we can get to that. And I, all I can do is say, I hope we all keep striving um, to get better and better and better. Powerful response, diversity of ideas. Um, Mark, and the last question would be, where do you see the country after November 4th? Well, you know, I'm, I am someone who believes in this country and in the strength of its people and the strength of its ideas. And I, like all of us, sometimes despair at the polarization that's taking place. Yes. But I travel a lot. I travel to other countries, other cultures, more frequently than I think most people do. And it is remarkable how similar you realize all of us in the United States are to each other in how we think and what we hold as being important and what our values are and how small some of the things that we feel are dividing each other right now actually are. Meaning, yes, we're gonna strike, we're, we're gonna fight, we're gonna argue, we're gonna think someone on the other side is full of crap. And that's the nature of a democracy. But I fundamentally think that um, this is a strong country. This survives all kinds of disruption and we'll, just, we'll survive whatever ones we encounter uh, on November 4th. Absolutely. Mark, where can people find you today in social media? So uh, I'll start off by saying that if you really want the long form version of what I think and some of the great stories behind the starting and growing in Netflix, I do encourage you to read That'll Never Work. If you don't have patience for a couple of hundred pages and you want it delivered to you in uh, 237 character bites, I'm on Twitter at MB Randolph, B as in boy. Uh, I'm on Instagram at That Will Never Work. But the source of all things Randolph is my website, which is markrandolph.com. That's Mark with a C and Randolph with a PH. Mark Randolph, an American entrepreneur, advisor, speaker, a father, a husband, an author, and an incredible human being. Thank you so much, Mark. Appreciate Peter, you. Thank, thank you. you so much for your time today, too. This was, uh, this was great. Really enjoyed thank talking with you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks for joining us today on another episode of the Coming Clean Podcast. Make sure to join Peter and his next guest on a brand new episode as we continue changing and impacting lives across the world. Share this episode with a friend, follow, subscribe, and leave a review. Go ahead and get it fast. Uh, get a dash in my position.